Brilliant. Okay. Well, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, I, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Benchling, which is a, a molecular biology suite for uh, research and um, an electronic lab notebook form. And I'm going to talk, it's, it's something that I encountered primarily as a, an aid to my own research, but I'm going to be talking about the ways in which I think it can be readily adapted for uh, teaching online and in uh, sort of blended formats. So, um, just as a little about me, uh, so I'm a lecturer in the Biological Sciences Department at the University of East Anglia. Um, I joined uh, just coming up to a year ago, um, and I'm teaching uh, undergraduate uh, genetics and also data science, and I've got a research background in gene drives and insect genetics, and so I've been using Benchling for a few years now. It's a fantastic um, research tool. Uh, that, that, that I use and, and that my whole group uses. Um, but for anybody that hasn't heard of it, essentially what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give a brief overview of what Benchling is, um, how it can be used as a learning platform, and then um, just a couple of examples of where I've used it in the classroom and things that I'm currently developing. So uh, Benchling is a uh, free or it's... Um, it's a free to academic model of uh, cloud-based software. So it is free to anybody with a .ac.uk account. They have their own uh, enterprise version, which they charge as a subscription to, to private companies. It's got two main features. It's got uh, an electronic lab notebook, and it's got a suite of molecular biology tools. Now, I should probably say at this point, there isn't anything particularly proprietary about the biology tools that they use. But what's really nice about it is that they pull a lot of web-based um, molecular biology tools into one sort of easy to access area and they integrate it really nicely with their lab notebooks. Um, because it's cloud-based, uh, it just runs off a browser. So you do need a stable internet connection, but uh, there's no software required. So students with Chromebooks will, will be able to use this sort of really easily. So this is the notebook. Um, the interfaces are fairly customizable. So this is uh, in a sort of a split format at the moment. So if it looks a bit busy, you, you, can, um, you can hide certain things and, and um, change your view. But essentially, uh, the notebook has uh, two halves. So you can write and design uh, protocols. And you can make, uh, make stepwise protocols for um, like, uh, laboratory protocols uh, for students to follow, or you could make uh, your, your objective could be for students to make their own protocols that they submitted to you. Those protocols can be attached to electronic lab notebooks where they actually store their data. So that's the example on the right uh, where they can keep lab notes and into this they can insert simple tables, simple formulae, um, they can they can put in um, sorry they can put in uh, pictures such as gel images such as the one below um, they can put in small sections of code chunk so they can they can put analyses into this as well um, and you can publish your lab notebook in HTML or PDF format so they can be encouraged to work in it they could also be encouraged to use it um, to produce something that they would actually submit for assessment which is quite nice. The other half of um, Benchling is uh, the inventory. So this is where you can store files and you can run a variety of different analyses and these can be incorporated back into the notebook. So on the left, uh, we've got kind of like a detailed sequence view here. Uh, we can zoom right in on uh, nucleotide or amino acid sequences. And there's a variety of different sort of annotation features. Uh, anybody that's ever used something like SnapGene will probably be quite familiar with this. Um, you can, so you can, um, you can make protein translations and you can modify and edit nucleotide sequences and see how uh, that changes your protein translations. You can label restriction sites. You can attach prim primers that either come from a database or that you've designed yourself. And you can annotate various stretches of, of DNA with uh, uh, coding domain sequences, UTRs, you know, whatever, whatever you want. 
uh, and then there's so, um, and then there is uh, uh, the overview. So this can be in a linear format, or if you've got a plasmid, it, it'll give you a sort of a circular map um, where you can see uh, sort of a, a zoomed out view of your particular um, fragment. And where it really comes into its own is just the range of tools that it that it gives you. So you can annotate manually. It also lets you pull um, annotations from a variety of different libraries. So it will um, it can auto annotate sequences for you. You can customize the view to show you um, restriction sites that appear in a sequence only once, or appear only twice, or as many times as they appear. And you can format these libraries so you can. Um, it has a sort of stock range of say like NEB restriction enzymes, but you can also put in custom libraries. So if you wanted to have something that was available, um, if you only wanted to have the restriction enzymes that your teaching lab actually has in stock available to view, then you could set that up. Um, you can edit and annotate primers and you can test um, you can you can check melting temperatures, hairpin formations, and so on. Um, it's got a really nice tool uh, for the notebook and the inventory, which is the history function. So essentially, you have a full documentation of exactly what a notebook or a um, sequence file has has been through in different iterations. So you can actually see how it's been modified. Um, it's got alignment tools. It's even got CRISPR design tools, so you can design guide RNAs. Um, it has a range of different genomes stored so that you can look for off targets and so on. If it doesn't have a genome in its database, you can write to them and ask them to put it in. Uh, they're very responsive. Um, and for things like plasmid design, it's really great. Um, you can, um, you can uh, run simulated digests. You can produce new chunks based on restriction digestions and ligate them together. You can do sort of classic um, class two restriction enzyme assays. You can also do Gibson assembly. Um, so for sort of plasmid design, which is the thing that I started using it for, uh, it's, it's really great. Um, and this is just another example of the lab notebook and the way you can integrate it. So you, if you take any files or analyses, you can um, import them into a lab notebook uh, and have a hyperlink. You can have it as a sort of a simple view like this, where um, you can't really see anything, but, but the, the analysis or the file is, is attached to the notebook. Or you can have a more complex view like this, where you can actually have an, um, the, uh, just a flat image um, summarizing a particular sequence or, or an analysis or so on. So, and then of course, you could potentially publish that um, in HTML or PDF format. Okay, so that's a sort of really brief overview of Benchling and all the different tools it has. I'm just gonna talk about why I think, uh, why I've taken the, the move to transfer it from just a research tool into a, a learning platform. It's got some really nifty features. So um, the same things that would apply for sort of managing a research group also make it a really good teaching tool, I think. So it has project and organizational level management. So I set up um, projects for different uh, year groups and um, undergraduate modules. Within that, they have folders which relate to different classes. You can set those folders to be either read-only, write-only, or fully editable. And that means that I can put master files into a sort of a non-editable folder that the students can access. Um, but they obviously can't um, accidentally delete something for the rest of the class. But then they can copy those into their own folders, um, which you can have as either fully private for the student, while you as an instructor maintain the ability to read and view and mark their work. Or you can set it up so that some uh, multiple students have access to one folder. So you can set it up for collaborative group work, um, or it can be fully open if you just want them to be able to share and compare notes. Um, you can make worksheets or protocols for them to follow, or you could task them with making protocols of their own. Um, it just gives us one, it gives me one place where I can see their lab report and their analyses uh, together. As I said, you can, you, the students have the option of making their own work private or shared, depending on what you want them to do. It's got this really nice um, timestamps and version history function. So within the software, you can tell um, when something was written 
um, and that's that's not editable by the by the students. So you've got a sort of a pure uh, logging. I think it's a plus that it's a sort of a browser only tool. I mean, it obviously does require a stable internet connection, although not a particularly powerful one. But it does mean that there's no um, software installation issues, and students could technically uh, they could use computers that are available within a uh, the lab. Um, then they could go home and they can access their own profile from their own computer. Um, so, so there's sort of a seamless integration there. Uh, and the thing that I really like about this is that this, it's a genuine research tool. I've used it for several years now. Um, I have many of my colleagues that really rave about it for their own research purposes. So what I really like about it is it's also an introduction to a genuine research tool. They get it and you can teach and introduce um, lab notebook keeping, various analytical tools, and introduce them to a piece of software that um, is genuinely useful uh, in, a, in a research environment. So yeah, so this, this first example is um, more of a sort of a standalone um, problem-based worksheet that, I, that, that um, I carried out with, with some of the students. And this second option is, is something that uh, I'm still developing. But the idea is that um, we, like I'm sure many other um, universities are looking towards a blended learning model um, where we're going to have um, severely reduced in-person teaching, including time in the lab. And so I'm trying to uh, develop or, or change our existing um, laboratory uh, experiment series to incorporate more asynchronous planning. Uh, and that's something where I, I think um, benchling or, or similar tools really can come into their own. So this first example. So uh, this was essentially, um, I made a, a worksheet out of a lab notebook on Benchling that just had a series of um, questions uh, for, for students to work through. It was designed to be run, um, it was designed to be run synchronously. So we had to use a, um, we use Blackboard Collaborate so that we had the option to have a sort of a, an, a, an online lecture, and we use the the breakout room facilities for um, from from Blackboard. But essentially, I could upload um, uh, genome information from NCBI on a variety of different SARS-CoV-2 genomes. They were uploaded to Benchling in sort of an inventory folder, and um, the students were prompted to work through um, the worksheets answering questions ab about the genome. So uh, they were prompted to make alignments between multiple different genomes and compare similarities. They were prompted to um, uh, finish annotations on, on the genome and add in information onto the, sort of the basic nucleotide sequence, uh, run protein translations for key genes, and then once we'd had some time understanding the, um, the COVID-2 genome, uh, used that as a springboard to start talking about the um, uh, quantitative RT-PCRs used as diagnostic tests. And we actually had a look at the um, primers, which are used by um, the EU, the UK, and uh, the US Center for Disease Control, and compared them against sort of uh, standardized um, primer design guidelines, and, and then we even got them to sort of design some of their own diagnostic primer pairs uh, using the, the sort of the, the rules that they'd learned. Uh, so the way that, that, that I ran that was that the, there was a brief uh, introductory lecture before we started. Um, I'm using Blackboard Collaborate, which has then the function of, of producing breakout rooms for students to work in small groups. And the worksheet was available on Benchling with the files and design tools that they needed. And I gave them the opportunity to either join uh, these, these, these breakout groups to work synchronously with me online, uh, so just sort of jumping in uh, to help where needed. But I also put a, a sort of an at your own pace walkthrough video accompaniment on YouTube. So um, students had the they, they also had the option to work through that sheet in their own time on their own with a sort of a, an accompanying help video if they wanted. And then I just collected some feedback and, and um, made some reflections on uh, how that worked and, and what I would change in the future. 
this is something that I'm, this, this is the other example, and this is something that I'm still developing at the moment. And this is a different approach. This is more trying to use the um, Benchling inventory and, and lab notebooks as a way to complement and optimize lab time. So we have some, um, we have a, a sort of a, real, what I think is a really nice um, series of lab experiments that I've uh, inherited from a, from a predecessor in the department, which looks at um, functional anal analysis of the mismatch repair pathway in E. coli, and they study um, mutant E. coli that are defective in the gene mute S, which means that they are uh, hypermutable, and it means that they generate spontaneous antibiotic resistance, and they can compare mutant versus wild type E. coli growing on um, a variety of different antibiotic plates. And then we uh, introduce, uh, we, we transform those E. coli with a plasmid that has a um, uh, functional copy of, of mutes to restore wild type functionality. And they have historically, they, they, they've come in, they've, they've, they've used this plasmid, they've transformed their E. coli and they've made comparisons between the sort of, um, well, restoring this gene restores functionality. But we're going to be facing a situation where we've got a lot less lab time. I also think that in the past they've they've had a lot of um they get a lot of lab uh, they get a lot of lab time. They do a lot of stuff physically. Sometimes I've noticed that some of the students actually get quite confused about why they're doing what they're doing. And so it was my intention to introduce benchling. Um, as a way to uh, get students thinking about what they're going to be doing in the lab before they arrive in the lab. Um, but it's just become much more sort of vital in that what we now have is probably about a third of the amount of lab time as they've, they've had in the past. And so I think it can be used as in a, a flipped uh, classroom uh, teaching tool, essentially, in that they can be set um, the task of testing uh, certain primers or certain um, plasmid restriction digest steps in uh, the computer environment before they show up to the lab. And so the idea is that students are essentially tasked with designing their own protocols and choosing the reagents that they're going to need to use before they walk into the lab. They walk into the lab already knowing what they're supposed to be doing and why, and then they can just pick up and go. And we have the option of including some of those analyses and write-ups from the lab um, with the computer analyses in Benchling, I can ask them to produce PDF reports that they can just print and submit direct from that software uh, if, we, if we decide to. So um, I, I reckon just a brief overview of two of these things. Um, so far, um, so I've, got, I've got some reflections on the, uh, the first exercise that we used. Um, I did find that um, group engagement with, with systems like Blackboard Collaborate has been very mixed. Um, some people really take to it, others find it um, a little trickier, um, they're not quite so keen to engage in, in the small groups on Collaborate. Having said that, I think that was, um, we did do this at the end of last term in the middle of a pandemic. I think a lot of people had a lot going on in their personal lives that you can't necessarily account for. Not at all the students were in the, the best headspace for sort of just carrying on with their learning as though nothing had happened. And they were getting to grips with some new technology that they weren't necessarily particularly familiar with. So uh, I think with some tweaks, Collaborate can work really well for getting some of that um, that peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning going that they might miss from, from, from being in the lab. Uh, Benchling does have a relatively steep learning curve. And so um, I would definitely um, spend more time with some very short introductory exercises and tutorials next time uh, to get them more familiar with the environment before setting them assignments. But overall, student engagement and feedback was, was, was really good. They, they found it difficult, but they also found it really engaging. And they um, explicitly told me that they really enjoyed learning new research tools and, and, and learning some new techniques. So that was really good. Um, moving forward, uh, I've actually been talking to some of the representatives from Benchling because they are very, very keen on developing their tools as a learning technology as well as a, a research tool. They have some very limited uh, tutorials that already exist on their website. 
but they are actually super keen to work with academics to develop these further. So uh, I've been speaking to them and I'm sure they would welcome other people that wanted to come forward and have a conversation about um, whether there's scope to make more um, more tutorials, more um, a sort of a, a collection of, of, of different lab protocols, et cetera. Uh, but if anybody is interested in talking to me more um, about uh, Benchling or either of those two exercises, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And um, I'm sure this will be available after the talk, but I've also put my Twitter handle and my email account for anybody to get hold of me. Um, but that's it. Thank you very much for listening.